Nutrition wise, what's the best thing you can eat? If you said broccoli, stay tuned. We'll tell you about growing it in your garden and we'll look at a number of other cold season crops for healthy eating and garden practices for healthy living. Straight ahead on Great Gardening. We're like producing a serious amount of food. We hope to be able to provide food for the community. I love sharing the garden with others. You can do a lot of fun things with broccoli. All of our students here are involved in gardening. It has a sign on the door that says my happy place and it really is. Hello and welcome to Great Gardening. I'm Pamela Fish, here to begin our 18th season of this program, and we welcome back our resident experts. Horticulturist and educator Bob Olin is here with us, as is our garden professional, Deb Burns Erickson. Thanks, you guys, for coming in. It's our pleasure. All right. We're feeling great. Mm -hmm. Feeling great. <laughs> Good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, we want to tell folks that this program was pre recorded due to the rapidly changing situation with COVID 19. A lot of our staff have been working from home, but we still want to bring you regular episodes of Great Gardening because gardening is increasingly important, especially at irregular times like these. I mean, things are a little bit crazy out there, um, but really, uh, I'm looking forward to the gardening season, and uh, it's a positive thing to think about right now. It's one of the best outdoor activities. You know, you're isolated, obviously, and it's so healthy, both mentally and physically. I really anticipate a great growing year, and we got weather conditions that are excellent for a good spring, and we're really looking forward to it. We're not stopping our plans at all. It takes some stress off the food supply. You know, if we can do that by putting in your own garden and maybe people that can't put their own gardens in, they could, you know, rely more heavily on the food supply. But if you can put your own garden in, you should just to maybe help other people out, not only yourself. Mm -hmm. Boy, that's a great comment. You know, I'm a little bit concerned about the elderly that might be boxed too. in and Absolutely. can't get fresh fruit and produce. And if you're going to share some of it, you have Please to up do. your plans just a little bit right now at this time for what yep. you're going to do when harvest time comes. Really help everybody. Great, great. Yeah, lots of positives in, in gardening. And as we move through our season, we will keep providing episodes of Great Gardening. They might look a little different or include some past favorite segments, but please continue to send in your questions via email. Here's the address for that. You can see it at the bottom of the screen. It's ask at wdse.org. Well, as mentioned, Great Gardening will be here for the next 10 weeks throughout much of the garden season while you're um, out there growing beautiful things. And uh, we asked our photographer, A.J. Larson, to put together a few shots of what we'll see in the season to come. A.J. and I, of course, were out all summer last year shooting gardens and shooting segments for the show, and, and we're really excited to bring you that. And, and I think it's just helpful to be looking at pictures of <laughs> flowers, don't you? Absolutely, and it's coming very quickly. It is, it yes. is, spring is here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, great for your mental health to, to even be thinking about it. Um, we know it's, it's cold outside right now and there, there is still a little bit of snow, but I have talked to people who are starting to see shoots come up in their yards. Yeah, we'll see that very quickly now. And uh, as we mentioned in our previous program, there's no frost in the ground if you had a good uh, snow, snow blanket. So mm -hmm. things are gonna jump pretty early. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. all right. Okay, well, on to our topic. Uh, broccoli is the vegetable of the year with good reason. Here's more on that. I'm Star Brainerd. I'm the Land Stewardship Coordinator at the Duluth Community Garden Program, and we're here to celebrate the vegetable of the year and the One Vegetable, One Community Program. you'll either buy starts or start them inside. Something a lot of us know and grew up with and are comfortable with, but it does grow very well for this climate, which is a big emphasis for our, our one vegetable, one community here in Duluth. We don't want to encourage people to grow something that they're going to have a high likelihood of failure. So we want something that really suits this climate. So that's probably a big reason why this one was a winner. Broccoli does like those colder temperatures, so you can actually put them a little bit in before the frost-free date. Broccoli is a brassica, so it's in the cabbage, cauliflower family. Um, 
So that's a plant that likes cooler temperatures. Um, it takes, you know, it's a decent amount of time to grow. You get one of the crowns and hopefully by the end of the season you can maybe get two or more. It's recognizable. I think it's a, it's a very fun looking vegetable. It's, it's distinct tree shape is pretty cool. You can do a lot of fun things with broccoli, like make broccoli pickles. Um, broccoli is a really good one to freeze, so that one keeps in the freezer, you know, as long as you want to keep it. And it is so good for you. While the nutrients in this vegetable, 245% of your daily value of vitamin K, 135% vitamin C, which helps fight against flu-causing viruses, okay. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, chromium, folate, you know, both of those high percentages, lots of fiber in this, in this vegetable. Lots of fiber, no calories, lots of vitamins and minerals, mm -hmm. yeah. and that other compound, the sulfur compound, sulf sulforaphane, mm -hmm. which is getting a lot of attention because it actually tends to suppress the inflammatory reaction within the body. So right. lots of research on that. Some submitted, I read just recently, from the University of Wisconsin. So mm -hmm. uh, it's a very, very uh, great crop from a nutritional standpoint to grow. And especially yeah. if you grow it yourself. It makes right. a huge right. difference if you grow it yourself rather than buying it grown elsewhere. Yeah. Right. Or yeah. local. Absolutely. The research mm -hmm. I saw said uh, broccoli is perhaps the most nutritious veggie overall. I think it really mm -hmm. is. If you, if you were to look at a composite, some may have a little bit more of one vitamin or another, but if you want a composite, that, that's probably it. Yeah. And you know, you talked about the nutrient density uh, for people that are even buying it in the store, you want deep greens. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you can do Makes this in your garden because that's the nutritional concentration you're really looking for. Real a lot of commercial product is, is run fast on light sands with lots of nutrients, so we, we pick up a lighter color. Mm -hmm. So you really want to shop for deep greens and you want to grow for deep greens. Mm -hmm. And let's look at mm -hmm. the varieties that uh, we w might want to grow around here. These are ones that you guys have both grown. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. let's uh, start well, talking we'll about the, the types. Yeah, well, uh, maybe we'll flip that list uh, right. over because there's one that's a little bit unique and uh, one Pac of your favorites. Uh, right, Pac-Man. Yep. And it's a, lo it's a lot of growers, I mean home growers' favorites mm -hmm. because it is a little bit smaller, but you, and it's quicker though, 50 yes. to 60 days on that one, where the others are 70 to 90 days and, and this gets a lot of nice laterals on and it. And Bob, you said Arcadia and Lieutenant uh, do, do better later in the fall sometimes? Yeah, I think other than Pac-Man, which is a small crop, you can put that in tight about mm -hmm. a foot across and you're going to get it very quickly, but not much lateral production. Uh, you want to take a look at maybe, if you want two crops, which I think is very realistic, you can look at a summer crop or one that you're going to harvest in the summer and one that will take a little longer and you'll be harvesting in the fall. Fall crops with our warm falls have been spectacular. And of this list, uh, Green Magic is one variety that kicks out real nicely by the mid to end of July and Arcadia nice. and Lieutenant are great fall crops, great lateral production. So there is a difference in varieties, but if you can't get your favorite, mm -hmm. just plant broccoli. Right, any of them will be. <laughs> Okay. Right. <laughs> and there are other vegetables in uh, the same family, which is called brassica, that are pretty easy to grow and also highly nutritious. Let's take a quick look at those, uh, starting with the cabbage. This is a, a ruby cabbage. This is color. ruby. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing in all of these vegetables, the, they're selecting for some color, which we get the anthocyanin, so they're even more nutrient dense. And, all of these are cool season crops, which are great for us up the north like this. Yeah, they grow really mm -hmm. well here. Mm -hmm. Love this shot of the, of the cauliflower head. Good friend, <laughs> this is Murray Salzer, and that's a, a cauliflower variety, which is very popular right now, mm -hmm. all the cauliflowers. Mm -hmm. That's one called Snow Crown, kicks out beautifully for a fall crop, and obviously Murray did a nice job growing that. Can we talk about this kale. one? Kale, kale, this kale, is kale, kale. Curly leaf kale. Yeah. Curly leaf kale, mm -hmm. and this is this is one I've kind of puzzled about. Because it's on the downward slide. Three years ago, you're mm -hmm. right. Everybody mm -hmm. wanted kale. Mm -hmm. Now nobody wants kale. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. All they want is mm -hmm. toilet paper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, grow your kale because yes, that'll uh, keep you healthy. Mm -hmm. And Brussels Brussels sprouts, which uh, come pretty late in the season. Cross, yeah. They do. You mm -hmm. have to be very patient with these. Deb, 100 to 120 days. But delicious. And, yeah. and they're really hot right now in, rest, in new recipes. They are. Everything Absolutely. but kale has just mm -hmm. become mm -hmm. very, very uh, highly and accepted yeah. by the public. But One mm -hmm. more we're going to look mm -hmm. at, kohlrabi. Mm. 
this could be your gateway rutabaggy <laughs> because it's got a nice mild rutabaggy taste to oh, it. I love it, just fresh out in the garden. So that's the gateway vegetable. The, the it thing, is. <laughs> the rutabaggy. thing is, uh, and for your kids, encouraging mm -hmm. to eat this group. Mm -hmm. Again, it's in brassica. It's got a lot of the same nutritional content. Not quite what broccoli does, but mm -hmm. people are using it as a substitute for carbohydrate. They're even Potatoes. making hash brown mm -hmm. kohlrabi. Right. Yep. Low calorie, great nutrition. Mm -hmm. Uh, none of the uh, the same carbohydrate concentration. Right. And cauliflower as well is being used a lot oh, uh, a in lot. place of potatoes and uh, yes. things with flour. Okay, let's get to some questions, you guys. Um, we've been having a few about the fruit flies and the raspberries the last couple years. This is from Amy. She says, um, I cut back my plants to one stock every fall. Does that help? What else can I do? And of course, we're talking about the spotted wing drosophila, which is that fruit fly that's getting in the ripe fruit. Right, mm -hmm. and it's become a major problem. You've seen it even zim farther north, mm -hmm. everywhere, mm -hmm. everywhere in the continental United States right now. And uh, I don't think uh, cutting back, you know, cutting back to one stem is going to be helpful because it'll it'll reduce the pressure of. Uh, fungal disease, mm -hmm, but we've mm -hmm. still got the insects. So for most homeowners, uh, I honestly think you can cover with exclusion mm -hmm. netting, but that's a major, it major is. process. Or you can do some rotational insecticides, but none of us really want to do that. And you have Don't to be very, eat that. Mm -hmm. no, you mm -hmm. want to be very diligent. So here's my advice. Grow your crop, keep it as clean as you can, as healthy as you can, harvest at maximum every two days, immediately get it refrigerated. And there now have been some studies that that refrigeration, not necessarily freezing, will actually uh, impact and reduce the number of uh, larvae and egg in that particular uh, fruit. Oh. But, and pick up anything that may fall to the mm, ground. So it's yes. a real rigorous uh, harvest and then following up with cool or process. You can always freeze mm -hmm, or you mm -hmm. can make syrups process. and other things. Well, I want to mention Beth sent in a question about her Bali cherry, mm -hmm. which also had uh, a problem with the spotted wing drosophila, which destroyed the crop. And so mm -hmm. it's getting into cherry trees and a lot of other fruits. Yeah. And, and strawberries. And strawberries. Can we? Well, we're going to get back to <laughs> strawberries. I'm going to let Deb uh, handle that because we had a question last week that mm -hmm. I didn't quite hear the, right. the nature of the question. But all fruit basically are vulnerable to mm -hmm. spotted wing mm -hmm. drosophila. Anything that's thin skin where they're not particularly vulnerable is early season because our, our populations emerge from the soil and they really propagate near the end of July. So we want to try to get, say, a June bearing strawberry is probably going to be a better choice for you. You get it harvested before you have the problem with the spotted wing drosophila. But many people will want to plant Ever the everbearing. They do, and that was our question. Last time was on um, what is a hardy ever-bearing strawberry for mm -hmm. I falls, but I didn't hear that. I just heard ever. I just heard strawberry, and we went for the June-bearing varieties. Okay. But for the ever-bearing varieties, there are a couple that are hardy, hardier, hardier. <laughs> and what hardier. would those be? Uh, f the two that we found to be hardier are Ogallala and Fort Laramie. Okay. They're older mm -hmm. varieties. Mm -hmm. And you know, people will ask about the difference between day neutrals and ever bears. Both of these groups set their fruit irregardless of day length. So they fruit earlier, you get a crop the first year in the fall. The main difference between the two is hardiness. So we get some of these older varieties, Ogallala, the Fort Laramie would be good varieties. The day neutrals, which have become very, very popular, and there are any number mm -hmm. of good varieties mm -hmm. out there, mm -hmm. they're really treated as an annual crop. Plant them every spring, harvest uh, late summer and into the fall and replant. Don't mm -hmm. try to bother bringing right. them through the winter. Okay, let's just switch topics real quickly. Should I put wood ash on my garden this spring? That's from Dan in Chisholm. Well, not without a soil test. Exactly. Because mm -hmm. okay. yeah. right. what will it put in the soil? Well, it, it does put a lot of nutrient in it, including potassium, okay. but the but biggest... you need to know how much. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the biggest yeah. factor, it changes your pH. pH it gives you a very basic condition. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I would not put any wood ash in mm -hmm. unless if I took a soil, soil test, test... Sent it to the university. To the university, mm -hmm. University of Wisconsin, University of Minnesota, and it called for lime. And yep. then you can apply even a little bit less of the actual wood sure. ash because it has a little higher what we call calcium carbonate equivalent. In other words, it's a better liming agent than lime. Yeah, lime. So a little bit less than what your soil test recommends for the uh, for the lime recommendation. All right, Frank from Mellon, Wisconsin wants to know, can I use the red pine chips from the trees I cut on my property? Um, can I use them as mulch or other things in well, my garden? The mulch, mulch, yeah. I mean, it should be able to. I don't Absolutely. know what the crop is that, you know, or yeah. what you're, but Other than should. mulch, can they be used for anything? You know what I, 
if you could chop them small enough yeah. or really mm -hmm. micro and you could add them to the soil and just amend the soil if you had a heavier soil it would be a good aerator to a soil mm -hmm. but I don't again know their soil yeah that's good and you know where I really like a wood chip they're all carbon they break down very very slowly mm -hmm. that's why they're great mm -hmm. as a mulch mm -hmm. you don't want the mulch to degrade you want it to perform its function controlling weeds but if you want to throw that, throw some of the chips into the compost mm -hmm. pile, they're not going to break down readily, but they aerate the pile. That's it. So okay. all of a sudden you get oxygen in there, then you're not doing so much of the turn, Turning. turn, turn. You've got a naturally aerating pile. So that's the way I use wood, uh, right. wood chips that way. Okay. Well, we're going to move on to our garden tour, which this week takes us to a lake north of Duluth where residents built their own log home surrounding it in garden beds. Welcome, uh, my name is Stella Libesmeyer. Uh, this is Little Alden Lake, uh, north of Duluth, and welcome to my gardens. Actually, I started on the lake side, okay. and then it kept growing. So my husband would all get, would get real nervous when I would take the garden hose and started making a shape. And then he knew I was planting another one, <laughs> and then another one. <laughs> So how many garden beds do you think you have? You know? I have about seven gardens. They're a combination, but I would say they're probably 90% perennials. I've got some um, uh, clematis over there, which is one of my favorites. It planted itself there, and I had an old fork. So I, I thought, oh, I'll hold it up with a fork. So that's what I did. I held it up with that fork, because there's a couple of tines missing. I like to repurpose things. My pots are made out of their old graniteware kettles, or repurposed. Uh, milk can up by the house, um, things like that. And here are some of my plates, my new hobby. I started doing uh, these plates. You pick them up at sales, Goodwill, Salvation Army, and start combining plates and things and, until you think you got it, and then you glue them together and you have a, a flower that you never have to water. And this hydrangea, that one's called Pinky Winky. It's huge, I have to keep cutting it back. It gets real pink in the fall and it's just beautiful. I had delphiniums here that were six, over six feet tall. So I've cut them all back and they were, some of them were, I left a few. I just love these colors in here. Purple and blue. This is an old uh, bird cage. It's not really a bird cage, it's a decorative bird cage. I just like to plant flowers in here and sort of whimsy. I moved some ligularia here. There used to be shrubs here, which I didn't like. I like things that die back down to the ground instead of picking leaves out of shrubs with branches. It's just too much work. This we did probably about five years ago. We hired a contractor to put in the pond, the waterfall, and this landscaping with the, the steps. And I have uh, fish in my pond, mm. goldfish, and uh, they love it in there. And I've got all kinds of resident frogs. They sit on the daylilies. It's fun just to sit on the porch and have a cold glass of lemonade and enjoy the sound of the water falling into the pond. And I enjoy watching the fish. I'm always counting them and looking for this one or that one. <laughs> and I like some of the metal art. There is a, looks like a bug made out of old screws, a spoon and bolts, nuts and bolts. And then I have another one. I have a ladybug over there. And these are planters, which I just love. My son and daughter-in-law gave me these frog planters. And so I put some patience in them. They are, they're like the sentinels before you come into the house. And over here, I've got some uh, angel wing begonias and they love it over here. They get morning sun and they like afternoon shade. because They love my, my flowers here. I get the mallow and everything mixed in here. Yesterday, I took a picture of uh, bees and butterflies just hovering all around. My husband and I hauled in rocks, rock wall, and stuck in sedums, and I don't know, gardening is relaxing. It's a way of losing yourself. You don't even realize how many hours you've been in your gardens. All of a sudden you go in the house, and, oh my God, it's that late? <laughs> that happens a lot. I really enjoy my gardens. That's my passion, my flower gardens. Thanks to Stella for that tour. The, the tip that she had was awesome. The one about growing the bigger perennials instead, instead of, of shrubs, shrubs because the shrubs catch weeds. I mean, if you want an immaculate garden, mm -hmm. you know, for winter, intra, you know, it really a great idea. And for beginners, 
you know, it'd be easy to clean it up. You don't have to guess. Right. Do we cut this back? How far to cut it back? Right. Beautiful gardens. Beautiful yes. gardens. If you can quickly uh, comment, it might be a great time if you do have some shrubs. This is the time of year to get out there with your shears and, and just mm -hmm. prune them back. It is. So mm -hmm. much of the time they mm -hmm. just abandon them and then they get rank and, and then they don't fit. But as background materials are fine. But I like mm -hmm. the fact that with uh, herbaceous perennials, you don't have deer pressure because it's all right. taken to the ground. Right. Too. All right, a few more questions we're going to get to. Um, Star from Duluth says, my gardens have very high phosphorus. Uh, can that have a potential negative impact, and how can I correct that? You know, it can at extreme levels. Yeah. And what happens, we have a lot of phosphorus in our soils, and people will add these um, balanced fertilizers. I'll use 10 10 10 as an example. So we got a lot of phosphorus to begin with, and they're constantly adding more. Mm -hmm. It isn't a major problem until it gets extreme. If it gets extreme, then you back off on everything, you just have to harvest crops. But soil test first, if you've got plenty of phosphorus, mm -hmm. use a fertilizer without that middle number. Okay. So use mm -hmm. a 20 zero, 10 or something like that. All right, um, when would be a good time to start seeds for this summer season? That's from Linda and Deb, you've been seeding oh, for yeah. a long time. Right. We've been <laughs> seeding since January, but it all depends on what you're growing. Yeah. Uh, you know, we haven't done any of the tomato or the brassicas or any of that those yet, but our peppers are well along and we did those the first week of February. Mm -hmm. It just depends on how quick of a crop it is, you know, and what you're starting. Really. Okay. Very good point. Yin from Duluth wants to know why my Concord grapes last year had a lot of mold. Was it too moist? Um, how long? And then, oh, that was the second question. Let's, let's answer that one about the grapes first. <laughs> I think with all of the uh, pressure we're getting, all the rainfall events, the high relative humidity, the high nighttime dew points, we're going to see more and more fungal disease. Uh, people may not want to use it, but you can use, uh, you know, some of the uh, copper-based fungicides. Some of them are, are approved for organic use. Uh, if not, you got to go to synthetics. And the reason most grape wines are grown in dry areas with irrigation underneath yeah, yeah. is to suppress uh, the pressure from fungal disease. Mm -hmm. What is the life expectancy for Honeycrisp apples, or a Honeycrisp apple tree, rather, not the apples themselves? <laughs> Both are good questions, yeah. actually. <laughs> well, you got a thought, thoughts on that? Well, I mean, I've always heard 20 to 30 years, mm -hmm. you know, but it is not one of the stronger varieties or hardier varieties for our climate, so that can knock it back a bit. Mm -hmm. That's a great point because remember with Honeycrisp, great apple went throughout the world and kudos to Dr. Bedford that developed it, but it was introduced as a zone four and not a zone three. Mm -hmm. And I've had, I've had zone three Honeycrisp for 15 or 20 years in zone three, but they, three B, warm zone three, but they look like a mess and they're not mm. very productive. Okay. So I would say Honeycrisp protected locations if you're north of uh, Hermantown even, I would mm -hmm. say. Right. And then uh, south of that, I've seen some beautiful Honeycrisp that are uh, in the Colquet region that mm -hmm. are 30, 40 years old. So they could last 40 or 50 years. If you're concerned about longevity, stay away from the dwarfing rootstocks. Stick Absolutely. with a standard rootstock that's going to be hardier for you and will give you more longevity in All the future. All right. Good advice. Thanks. Well, gardeners love to share, so they send us great pictures of their plants and flowers. Here are some of those beauties. Terry Norton of Duluth shares gorgeous close-ups from last summer's garden that include some of the first flowers to arrive when the crabapple tree blossoms and the Elizabeth magnolia tree comes to bloom. Bleeding Heart is an early summer favorite. And then there are the peonies, plus some especially lovely lilies. Here's a hydrangea from Terry's garden. Later summer blooms like bee balm bring in the hummingbirds and bees. While nearby pollinators are entreated by the echinacea, our coveted purple coneflower. Jim Fonger grows a mass of yellow evening primrose below the deer statues that stand sentinel in his Hawthorne, Wisconsin gardens. Nearby, a bear statue sits among an array of summer blooms. And again, the coneflower calling in a monarch butterfly in this instance. And it will be a bit before Pam Lagarde of Duluth sees her sunflowers get to this size but by late last season, they had grown to some 12 feet high behind her house. Pam also grows, guess what, 
the popular purple cone flowers, this group attracting both butterflies and bees. If you have photos of attractive plants and flowers to share with us, send them to greatgardening at wdse.org so we can show what you grow. And please keep sending in your photos. Uh, we love getting them and using them on the air. Okay, one more question from Alan outside of Superior. Spruce trees by the driveway are 40 feet tall, but they have brown needles on the east side facing the highway. The other ones across the drive are fine. Ooh, now that might be interesting. Near the drive, there's a possibility of salt, salt contamination. Salt, that's what yeah, I was thinking. Yeah. Salt but damage. normally that would be what? And you have well, wherever the road or the seconds. drive, <laughs> wherever the road or the driveway is, because yeah. salt can volatilize. So that may be that situation mm -hmm. right there. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. We um, Deb brought all this alyssum, mm -hmm. right? Lobular alyssum. It tastes like broccoli. It tastes just like broccoli. Yeah. So um, and they, they get out of control, control for you. Then you can just cut them back and mm -hmm. eat them. Wonderful. Wow. And the nutritional okay. content is good as broccoli? Oh, yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah. No, no, but okay. <laughs> we have no we, idea. Again, we want to give you guys a, a reminder to keep watch on our website for updates. Also, the WDSE Facebook page and Great Gardening WDSE on Instagram uh, for your garden pictures. And in the coming weeks, new videos of tips and tours from garden sites all across the region. So we're going to keep at it here. But Great Regardless, despite ahead, all that's right? going on in the world, and I'm yeah. really excited about gardening season. I know you guys are as well. We want to thank you so much, Bob Olin, Deb Burns Erickson, for being with us here at Great Gardening. From all of us here, stay well and enjoy the garden.